Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. Episode 1, The Anachron Campaign. This is a read-through of the book series Cylindra Draconi, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare, as read by the author, D.S. Pope. All character graphics were created by the author from the website heroofmachine.com. Sound effects are downloaded from soundbabble.com. Background music has been composed by Kevin MacLeod at Encompatech.com. I do all of this work for free. My videos are not monetized. If you wish to support my work, please purchase the original book on Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box. Act 1. The Beginning of All Things Chapter 1. The Half-Blind Blacksmith Every story is true for one man, maybe the man who tell it, or maybe for everybody in the village, or maybe for someone not yet born. I wasn't five years old when I heard this one. I asked my mama about it. She laughed and told me it was a story to scare the children and make them behave themselves. I asked my papa. He told me this. Son, for most folks, this story don't mean nothing. A story is like a feather blowed about by the wind. Some folks see that feather and say, oh, there's a feather, and that's all. One day, a man pick up that feather and weave it into his bow, the thing that protects his house from bad spirits. The same way with the story. One day, a man picks it up and makes it his own. And then it is true. Harold Corlander, the African. How do myths begin? Well, myths usually start with a real person whose lives and history become blurred through the hazy and scratched lens of time. The stories people tell of this person are often more interesting and even better written than the true history of the person being discussed. It gets to the point that one could hardly distinguish between what is fact and what is fantasy, even to the point of questioning the person's very existence. Such are the legends surrounding the Dragon Riders, who fought a long succession of bloody and ruthless battles over the course of an entire decade, the outcomes of which tried the souls of the peaceful people of the kingdoms of Pashia. When I sat down to write the story, I tried the best I could to sift through the myriad of often conflicting reports surrounding the events of the Dragonian Wars to tell a story that is close to reality as possible. Principally, one might say it is, it is the story of the noble Guard Knight General, His Majesty King Lennox of Agapolonia. Or to a larger extent, it is the story of all who fought alongside him. From my perspective, it is the story of the beautiful Sky Dragoness known as Slender Dragon Eye, who would ultimately become my closest friend and confidant, and who won both my implicit trust and my heart. The story has to begin somewhere. It might as well be here, in a dark and abandoned blacksmith shop, just inside the walls of Meridian Castle. The new owner, an old army blacksmith who had only moderate success working in the surrounding villages, just walked into his new shop. King Lennox always adored blacksmiths. The room was dank, dusty, and disheveled. As he began to look around the shop, he took mental inventory of his assets, assuming such a term might be used in this case. Within this dusty, dark room rested the broken, twisted, and corroded remains of armor and weapons left over from the war. As the blacksmith scanned over these resting relics of warfare, he silently considered all of the work that was ahead of him. And that sword in the corner seems to be in good repair. He will inspect the blade more closely to see if it was salvageable. The steel breastplate on the under shelf was no good to him at all. Even if the war were still raging and the Garden Knight Order still wanted to use such items, most of them have long switched to much thicker, sturdier style of armor when they started their campaign against the Dark Fortress on the Jacket Cliff in the land quite a distance away from here. He frequently thought that they should have changed the name of that place to something a bit more, uh, what was the word he was thinking of, um, epic? Uh, such as the name of it in a dungeon in a role-playing game wherein he finds the final boss of the game, 
He can only be defeated, of course, if you have the obligatory four members in your party, the paladin, the warrior, the mage, and the cleric. Along the way, the obligatory four meet such ubiquitous characters as the runaway princess, the mountain man who talks to animals, the mysterious mass martial arts experts, numerous knights in shining armor, and of course, the dragons. Then again, Dark Fortress on the Jacket Cliff is far more foreboding than the original Klingon. But that, of course, my dear readers, tells us how myths end. In this book, we are far more concerned about how myths begin. The blacksmith began to pace around his new shop, his hard-soled leather boots making a hollow sound that echoed throughout the room. He clutched the side of his fur cloak and shivered. He had forgotten how cold a blacksmith's shop could be if the forge was not lighted. Looking over to the far left side of the wall, he spotted an old wooden shield and decided that a closer examination was in order. It appeared to be a simple shoulder shield of nominal value, the type worn by the cavalry that provides protection whilst keeping both of their hands free. Basically triangular in shape, it was almost square at the top with long rounded sides that tapered towards the bottom of the shield where the two sides met at a single point. Any design or crest that may have been present had long since been scraped off in the heat of battle. But the blacksmith was well aware of this particular shield design was standard issued for the guard knights of Eastern Pastia, which in turn was nearly identical to the ones in the southern kingdom of Agapolonia. Whichever army the shield originally belonged to was hardly of concern to the blacksmith. All he cared about was salvageability which is a word of such peculiarity that your most gracious and esteemed author paused his text entering endeavors long enough to ascertain whether or not salvageability was spelled correctly in accordance with his spell check program. Alas, he could not say for certain as remarkably enough the word did not seem to be listed in the spell check dictionary. Sympathy Sagicka Willow, the invisible fairy who lives behind the author's right ear, narrowed her eyes and scowled in the author's general direction, but otherwise let him be. The blacksmith, having nearly lost his patience with the author's incessant interruptions, continued his inspection of the broken shield. He found the shield cracked nearly beyond repair. It was hopelessly splintered in numerous places, and many of the nails holding the planks together were either missing or bent. When he turned the shield around, he was taken slightly aback when he noticed a portrait painted on the inside of the shield. It seemed to be a very simple painting of a young man in a Highlander's kilt and sporan, seated next to an elegantly dressed young lady with long flowing blonde hair. He surmised that the man in the painting must have been the owner of the shield, and the lady must be his wife. The blacksmith was quite impressed that the portrait had remained fairly intact, given the amount of use that the shield must have received in the heat of battle. It was such a pity that he would have to use the shield for firewood. Last your most intelligent and impossibly handsome author appears to be wasting his reader's time on matters of little importance. Why is there such an emphasis placed on this singular wooden defensive device? It was as if this one shield was the most important, nay, the only important item in the entire shop which the more diligent readers must have surmised is under new management of a character described as a half-blind blacksmith. Really now, how can this one shield be all that important? Indeed, one may presume, if one is so inclined to do so, that every sword, every musket, every breastplate, every helmet, and every bow in the shop must tell its own unique story, provided that this is one of those fantasy tales in which inanimate objects possess the magical ability to speak. Perhaps to tell a wayward prince that the location of the mystical armor of incorruptibility was behind the door to the left. But this proved to be problematic for several reasons. First, the prince did not know his left from his right, which goes a long way to explain why he's in this particular predicament in the first place. Second, the magical talking inanimate object in question almost never tells the truth, which in the end proves to be much more interesting than the more restricted version of never tells the truth, as one never really knows whether or not this is the one time that it is actually being truthful. Third, with the object's irrepressible need for falsity, it did not bother to tell the prince that both doors, in fact, lead to more dangerous portions of the dungeon, 
and that the best advice would be for him to turn around and go back the way he came. And finally, much to my dear reader's everlasting chagrin, there was no mystical armor of incorruptibility in the first place. And of course, all of this raises the question, what the bloody hell does any of this have to do with the half blind blacksmith? So the titular character in our opening chapter turned towards the anvil. Most assuredly, this is the one object in the entire shop which was intact. After all, one can expect to see a broken shield after many years of intense warfare. It takes a very special type of talent to break a blacksmith's anvil. To test his hypothesis, he picked up his hammer and... Wait, why were there bows? The author certainly realizes that he appears to be stalling and padding out the first chapter worse than an undergrad milking one's slightly irrelevant source so he can add another page to his term paper when the professor wants him to hurry up and get to the bloody point. But this situation is quite peculiar indeed. Surely, is any person capable of bridging a synapse every once in a while already knows quite well. A bow was better suited lining the walls of a Fletcher or Yeoman, not a blacksmith. But there they were, stuck in the corner of a shop, barely visible in the low light seeping through the shop windows, hoping not to be noticed. He had quite the prodigious assortment of bows waiting his inspection, all of which would simply stand there patiently until he condescended to walk in their general direction. There were long bows, short bows, honey bows, composite bows, crossbows, and one more type that the author could not be arsed to actually look up. There they all were, lined up against the back wall. The blacksmith, who as you may recall is the principal character in this chapter, had long ago stopped paying attention to the author's constant insane ramblings, and had decided to stop working even before the author had texted such activity into the narrative. He hoisted his hefty hammer high above his head and slammed it downward onto the top of the anvil with such force that a long metallic ring reverberated off the walls of the shop. To him, it was the sweetest sound in the world and the only sound that would ever bring a smile to his battle-scarred face. It was the sound of industry, the sound of expert craftsmanship for which he was well known. At least it ought to have been. This sound was much different from those hammer strikes he was used to hearing, for when he slammed his hammer down upon his anvil, the sheer force of the strike caused the head to break off, fly across the room, crash into the side of the forge. From thence it bounced back towards the blacksmith's dirty shoes, almost as if to dare him to take action. At this point, the blacksmith would have cursed out loud, provided he was still physically able to do so. However, he did not have time to ponder his predicament before he heard derisive <laughs> laughter coming from behind him. With the broken handle of his hammer still in his hand, he turned fiercely around to face the person who would dare laugh at him in his present circumstances. For some unexplained reason, he cast his eyes to the dusty floor and slowly lifted his gaze, as if a man with a video camera was in his place, panning the camera upwards to provide the audience a point of view examination of a blacksmith's visitor. Man wore black leather boots and matching leg guards, laced tightly up to his knees and kept as clean as possible, despite walking around in mud and grime. Next, my dear readers would be sure to see a pair of black wool knee breeches, dyed in dark blue and tucked into the top of his leg guards. Above the breeches, the soldier wore a long coat and waistcoat, made of the same dark blue woolen material. He had a white leather belt around his waist as Passion soldiers do not wear the cross belts on the chest that are normally associated with this type of uniform. Attached to this was a scabbard holding a standard issued short sword, which for the most part matched any of the swords already in the shop. Upward still, the reader is keen enough to notice the two red inverted chevrons sewn onto the man's coat sleeves, which indicated the man was a corporal, he had seen combat, and he had been wounded. Of course, my dear reader is also aware that this rank insignia was not concordant with any modern military uniform regulations. Following a line formed by a series of 12 brass buttons down the front edges of his coat, which in turn matched a line of smaller brass buttons running down the center of his waistcoat, we come to two clasping ring devices connecting a black and blue cape to the shoulders of his coat. 
This was, of course, another huge departure from their true life 18th century counterparts. Apart from making the Garden Knights look like superheroes, the cape also served as a blanket during those long, cold winter nights and often was sliced apart to provide bandages for the wounded. This cape was as unimportant and nondescript as the ring that fastened it to the soldier's coat, except for one crucial detail. The two rings were not identical. On his left shoulder, he wore a simple brass ring, which in turn matched his coat buttons. But on his right side, the ring was solid iron, with a gold wire wrapped around it in such a way that it looked like a tiny gold dragon in flight, with his snout circled around so that its tail was caught between his teeth. This was a rare and prestigious award presented only to a small handful of soldiers who had distinguished themselves in combat. The Order of the Circling Dragon, as it is known, dates back hundreds of years and is the highest honor the King of Pashia awards to his army. In fact, the blacksmith personally only met six people who wore the Biting Dragon, as some call it. Two were royalty, one had fallen in battle, and another still had become, by the time of this chapter, the colonel in command of the castle guard. The other two, to the best of his knowledge of course, were the blacksmith himself and his former apprentice. The blacksmith tried to see who this mystery man was, but the light in the shop was dim and the soldier wore his tricorn hat low on his face. In one single motion, he removed his hat, bowed down elegantly to the blacksmith, and then stood up straight as a board. Good to see you again, John, he said brightly, as if he had the honor of speaking the first line of dialogue in an entire book series. Ironic, is it enough? The blacksmith's first task is to repair his own hammer. John, as we should now call him, even though it is not his real name, held up the broken handle and spurt at his young apprentice. Then he bent down to retrieve the hammerhead. The corporal, meanwhile, began to look around the shop at this thing or the other until something interesting caught his eye. Colonel Brooks, he said thoughtfully as he began to pace towards the broken shield leaning against the back wall. John took another look at the shield but did not think that the painting bore any resemblance to the aforementioned garden art colonel, who of course was the only Colonel Brooks that he knew. The corporal picked up the shield and examined it closely. After a few minutes, he finally gave it a rather disdainful look. Even still, his goal was set. I believe I found my first project. Do you mind? John shrugged in the general direction of the notion. He was just going to use the shield for firewood anyway. But those longbows over there in the corner turned their darndest not to look conspicuous could serve that purpose just as well. Further, he was unconcerned because guard night salaries are paid by the castle. So it is a trivial matter for apprentices to complete these types of personal projects. This is going to look beautiful, the corporal boasted, though the blacksmith remained doubtful. That concludes this segment of Slender Dragon Eye, a novel perspective of the psychology of warfare. In the next edition, we actually meet the titular character, and not some bloody half-blind blacksmith. If you wish to support me in my work, please purchase the original book from Amazon Kindle from the link in the description box.